Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Eric Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. Well, if you have your Bible, why don't you get it open to Genesis chapter 37. And we are going to, <clears throat> we're going to jump into an amazing story that actually takes up a big portion of the book of Genesis. It takes up 14 chapters, and so we, I am not that dumb to try to cover 14 chapters in one message. It's tempting, but it's not the best thing to do. So I'm going to just cover a portion of this story, and my goal is that this would actually segue into at least a part two in the coming weeks. And so if you only come today and don't come the next time, you're only going to get part of the story. But hopefully you at least get the podcast and so on and so forth. Recently, I watched a fictional story of a survivor of the Rwandan genocide. She was rescued amongst the remains of hundreds of bodies from the Tutsi tribe. She was a toddler, and she was underneath the bodies of hundreds of people that had been killed. She was eventually adopted by a high-level British prosecutor who ended up being a lead prosecutor in war crimes relating to the genocide. This young girl had no name and therefore was given a new name. The story weaves this unfathomable atrocity in this young girl's journey in becoming an adult with the years of pain and trauma. The movie shows, <clears throat> excuse me, the movie shows her journey and how life is trying to pull her forward, but she simply cannot. So she ends up going back to Rwanda to understand who, what, and why this happened. The door to her future wasn't in front of her. It was actually behind her. The title of today's message is The Future Has a Back Door. Look at your neighbor and say, The Future Has a Back Door. (laughs) This will actually be a part four to a series that we started a few months ago called Hello Future. You know, this weekend, I had taken most of this past week off to catch up on projects around my house. And because it had rained most of the week, I wasn't able to get as much done, which I'm a guy that likes to get a lot of stuff done in a certain time frame. And when that doesn't happen, you know, a lot of things can happen to me. I have to rustle through a lot. So Friday and Saturday were sunny days. So on Friday, I rented a trencher. I needed to put some new irrigation into a bunch of our trees because the previous irrigation wasn't working properly. So I decided just to go all out. So I rented this big trencher. If you don't know what a trencher is, it basically digs the ditch for you. But it's like, a, it's like a small car. It's pretty heavy. It's a pretty, it's a pretty hefty thing. So I was excited. I love renting equipment because it's, it's just cool. I mean, I don't know what it is, whether it's a tractor or a trencher or anything. I, just, I, like, I rented a bobcat once. That is fun. Bobcats are a lot of fun, by the way. So I rented this trencher, and my goal was Friday to cut the line, cut the trench, about five, 600 feet of trenches, and then lay, lay my irrigation lines in there, my pipes. Well... Since it's been raining so much, the ground is definitely on the soft side. And I knew that, and I thought, well, that would make it easier to dig, which made it really easy to dig. And so I thought, there's one section I need to redo. So I decided to go in there and cut it back out, and it's got tracks like a little tank. I mean, it's a, it's a hefty little thing. And I started digging, and the next thing I know, this thing starts to lean. And I try to back out, and I'm like trying to do all the work. And to make a very long story short, this thing ended up in two feet of mud. And I have a main water line, like, right there. Like, I literally, I found out about four inches away from that main water line. So I was like, oh, this is going to be a, just a disaster. And actually, before that one sank, I had another one that morning that broke on me. So I had to return that. I live out in Palisadro, and I had to return it to West Side, which is almost like driving to Eureka from where I'm from. <laughs> So I had to take that one back. I got another one, hauled it back. So I'm already like losing time trying to get this job done. And so now the second one sank two feet of mud. So I'm digging it out. And the more I tried, the, you know, I tried everything I could think of. It just kept getting deeper and deeper in the mud. And I thought, you know, when you, you know, when things aren't going well, you start thinking interesting thoughts. <laughs> this is actually one thought I had. What if I just bury this thing and tell him I don't know what happened? <laughs> But let me just keep. Bear, let me just let this thing go four feet on the ground, and I just put mud over it and go. Somebody took it. I don't know. <laughs> I would never do that, but that thought went across my mind. So 
so I thought, well, I'll get my truck. So I got my four-wheel drive, my F-150, and I attach it, and I'm trying to pull it, and I engage my four-wheel drive, and, and then it basically sounded like my transmission was going to blow up. It started grinding, and I'm like trying to turn it off, and it's like things are just getting worse and worse. Yet one of those days, you know, where things, nothing's working. The only thing that worked is you woke up. That's about it. And so I'm like disengaged, my, I, and I got under my truck, and there was no explosion. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to be using my four-wheel drive for a while until I get it fixed. So I put my truck away, and I'm digging out. Four hours go by, and I'm like, shoot, the only thing I know to do, so I call my friend up, Ken. Ken's here, and Ken's the man. Give it up for Ken right here. <laughs> and so I call my brother up. and say, Brian, I need to borrow your tractor. And I didn't tell him why. I was too embarrassed. I just needed to borrow his tractor. And so I went over, got his tractor, pulled it out, and Ken and I pulled it out on first attempt. And, and I said, that's it. My day is done. I don't want to do anything else that something can go wrong. You know, those kind of days. And it's, it's funny thing about expectations, the funny things about something that you want to get done is when things don't go the way they're supposed to go. It's an interesting journey. It's an interesting process. There, there's mental stuff you have to work through, emotional stuff. And like today, after this service, I'm going to hop in a car and drive to San Francisco. It would be really strange if the driver decided to go to Oregon first. Why? Because I know where San Francisco is, so my heart is in that direction. My mind, I'm literally aiming south. And when someone takes you north, it throws you for the loop. You're like, what's going on here? You know, one time we were in uh, Bethel, Atlanta. We go out there every year, and we usually go from Saturday to Wednesday morning, and we catch the first flight out Wednesday so we can get back here by that evening and not get back super, super late. And we've been to the airport so many times over the year, 10 years, once or twice a year we go, that I know how to get to the airport from our hotel. We've been doing it so many years. Well, a couple of years ago, one of the pastors picked us up and started driving us, and we are not going the normal route to the airport. Now, I don't live there, but I've been there so much. I'm like, this guy, I don't, maybe he's lost. Maybe this pastor who lives there is lost. That's what my mind said. And I didn't trust that he knew where we were going, so I kind of secretly pulled my phone out. I loaded up Google Maps. I'm like, oh, I guess there is another way to get to the airport. Isn't it interesting that, I mean, I would say for most of us in our own life, however old or young you are, you've had enough experiences where you arrived at a destination, but it you was not the way you thought you should go. Had anybody experienced that more than 20 times in your life? But once you arrived there, you're like, I would have never chosen that road, but I'm so glad because it turned out way better than I expected. Isn't it interesting, even after all these years, we still grapple with what's ahead of us right now. Like, God, why can't it just work out this way? Why can't God, and then we, you know, five years later, like, man, that was so glad, God, you're such a better person at this than I am. But then the next five years, we're like, God, why can't, and it's just this, it's just this conundrum we're in, all, and everybody, there's no one, if you can't relate to this, it means you were born two weeks ago. Because <laughs> this is just like part of life. We just, we, we love what's happened, but we don't like what's coming. So the title of today's message, Your Future Actually Has a Back Door. Sometimes, I, I can't think of very many times in my life where what was ahead of me actually had a front door. It's actually, it was a completely different way to get there. And sometimes the Lord, for his own, because he wants to, likes to take us in a different road. In December, I taught on a message all alone with God, which by far my most vulnerable raw message I have ever spoken in 20-something years. And I've shared it a number of times since December and I think, I'm like, I'm going to take a break from this message. I am raw enough right now. I'm feeling a little bit naked in front of a lot of people. And I like it, but I'm good right now. Anybody have that experience? You're like, okay, I'm good. Like, my heart's been exposed. Now I just need to let it continue to get better. But in that message on, in December, I used the story of Jacob and Esau. And I want to do a quick recap of Jacob because we're going to talk about one of Jacob's sons. My heart for you today is to do your best to immerse yourself into the shoes of the people that we talk about today. Because it's hard to describe. Like I asked you, I was really struggling all week of how much ground to cover today because there is so much going on in these 14 chapters that you could literally take maybe a chapter, a message, just to try to explain the gravity of the scenario that Jacob was in, specifically Joseph. But we talked about in December, Jacob was a 97-year-old man by the time he, that one night, he went and wrestled with God. 
Now, we know that Jacob, you know, that night he, he wrestled with God. And at one point in the wrestling match, God's like, I got to get out of here. And, and Jacob said, you're not leaving until you bless me. And God says, okay. And he dislocates his hip, which is just an odd way of blessing someone. You know what? <laughs> you know, and I think it's important for us to remember that sometimes the blessing of the Lord is not what we think it should be. One of my favorite stories of blessing is, is Jason's dad, Chris. How the Lord promised him to bless him in life and then got him into business. <laughs> and then Chris talked about nine years of hell of running a business and God called that a blessing. So make sure we have a much broader understanding of what the word blessing means because it doesn't always mean what we think. Sometimes it can mean the opposite. But the Lord called it a blessing because in the end he wins. And so Jacob dislocates his hip or God dislocates his hip and remember, before that day, Jacob was a very dysfunctional man. He was running from his path. He's running from his brother. And he had lived a life of lies and deceit, like you would not believe. But he came out of that experience with God, a completely different man. He was limping the rest of his life, but he was no longer in a prison. You see, Jacob was known as the great deceiver. Now, we have to ask the question, how would Jacob become a great deceiver? His mom taught him. Now, I don't think his mom intentionally thought, I'm going to teach my son how to be the greatest deceiver of all. I don't think any mom or dad thinks about teaching their kid to be the worst people on the planet. I don't think it's an intention. There may be people out there, and I'm sure they are, but for the most part, most parents don't think that way. It's just something that kind of gets passed down, and you don't know how to parent well. And so Jacob's mom teaches his son how to be the great deceiver. And so Jacob, from a very, very early age, learned how to deceive everyone. And the person that he deceived a lot was his older brother. And in this case, he deceived his older brother by tricking him to sell him his birthright. And then they fast forward to 70 years old. Now Isaac, their father, is getting old, and he's lost his sight. And he makes a comment. He says, hey, I want to bless you. I want to, I want to release the father's blessing on Esau because he's the oldest. That was tradition. But Rebecca, the mom, heard it and said, Jacob, when Esau leaves, go in there, put animal hide on, bring a meal in, and then because your dad can't see you, he'll feel you, and when he feels the animal hide, he'll go, oh, this is my son Esau, when obviously it's not Esau, which kind of showed you how hairy Esau was. <laughs> and so the story transpires where Jacob goes in, and he puts the animal fur on, and Isaac reaches out and goes, oh, my son Esau, and releases the blessing on him. Something powerful about that moment is that once, especially in, in the understanding that they walked in on the Father's blessing, was that once it's given, it can't be taken back. So as Jacob is leaving the scene, Esau comes in and Esau realizes what had happened. So he had a younger brother had been deceiving him his whole life, and now he just pulled the mass deception. So Esau makes a comment to Jacob and said, I'm going to kill you someday. I'm going to kill you. So as a result of that, Jacob ran. Now, Jacob runs, and he, he finds a girl, finds a girl named Rachel, and he's thinking, man, I like this girl. I want to marry her. She's, she is the woman of my dream. She is the one I want to marry. So she goes to the father. He goes to the father and says, what do I need to do to get your daughter? And he says, work for me for seven years, and then uh, you can have her. He's all awesome. And the Bible actually said that he worked for seven years, and it felt like one day. That was how much he loved Rachel. So seven years go by. Now, this is one of the greatest mysteries in the Old Testament, what happens next, because they have a wedding ceremony. And now, in the Middle East, a wedding ceremony wasn't a Western wedding. Like, in the West, we're like, the shorter the wedding, the better. That's just how we think. There, it was days. There was multiple celebrations. It was a big old process. It wasn't just a one-day ceremony. It was taking place over time. So I don't know what happens here, but at some point, the father-in-law swaps out the daughters, now, you would think Jacob would recognize that. You would think like, hey, this isn't the one I work for. But he doesn't. So much to the point that at the consummation of the moment of intercourse, they sleep together. They wake up the next morning and Jacob goes, wait a second. <laughs> Who is this? So I don't know how, that, how you get there, but that's a really bad place in life to get right there. So Jacob comes out of the room, he goes to the father-in-law and says, what's the deal here? You, isn't that interesting that Jacob was the great deceiver, and yet he found someone that was better at his dysfunction than him? <laughs> I love how sometimes you find people that are better at your dysfunction than you. <laughs> and what we do, like, oh yeah, and we want to out-deceive them, we want to un outdo them. But you know what, I want to make a point here, because this is uh, not my main point, but it is a point. 
is that most people in Scripture try to outdo someone that had the same dysfunction. There's one man who's later in the story. His name is David. David decided not to respond out of dysfunction to Saul. When Saul tried to kill him, David refused to act like him. So I want to challenge each one of us today. If you run into your partner on the opposite side of the road that is better at your dysfunction than you, your goal is to not respond with the dysfunction. Your goal is to take the high road and let God be your vindicator. Look at your neighbor and say, God is my vindicator. I don't know if that's a word, but it sounds like it. Vindicator, I don't know if that's a word. It sounds like Terminator, but it's close enough. And so, so he worked for seven more years to get the, the daughter that he really wanted. I have to lay a huge foundation to get to Joseph because I want you to understand that the pain that Joseph went through was massive. And so Jacob worked another seven years. Finally, he gets the woman that he wanted all along, Rachel. So now he has two wives, 14 years of labor. And now by that time, they begin to notice that Joseph has an anointing on his life. He, the Bible actually said the Lord was with him. And there's a favor on him. Everything he did was successful. And Laban goes, man, I like this guy around because when he's in my world, everything I have gets more successful. My wealth is growing. So Jacob's like, listen, I got to work out a deal here. So they work out a deal, and the deal was this, that he would manage the flocks. And then he, Jacob would get a certain one, and Laban would get the other. Well, in the course of six years, Jacob's flock grew so much that the power shift took place, meaning Jacob became more wealthy or beginning to challenge the wealth of his father-in-law. And because of that, the family had some issues. So Jacob decides to run again. And this is where he runs and he basically comes to the moment where he wrestled with God. One last thing about this before we go to one of his sons named Joseph. Is that when he would heard that his brother was coming to kill him, he decided to project all of his successes. How did he do that? All of his wealth, he sent it in front. He wants his brother to see all of his successes before he sees him. That was the night before he went with God, wrestled with God. And so that was the plan before he wrestled with God. On the night he wrestled with God, he woke up the next morning and he changed his plan. He said, never mind, I am going to go in front of all my successes. One of the keys to breakthrough is you put yourself out in front of all the accolades, all the successes in your life, and stop projecting something that you only want people to see. One of the keys to internal breakthrough of any dysfunction in your life is to put yourself out in the, most place, in the biggest place of vulnerability so people can see who you really are. And so Jacob, Jacob decided to do that. And the story turned out very differently than I think Jacob imagined. Jacob and Esau embraced. And it's an amazing story of reconciliation on some level. So now we're going to fast forward to Jacob had 12 sons. And he had two that he probably loved the most. Why? Because the wife that he loved the most, whose name was Rachel. And Rachel had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Now when she was giving birth to Benjamin, she passes away. And so... Um, Jacob eventually, he, he, he slept with two wives and, two, and one of their, each of their servants and got a bunch of boys out of it. It's kind of a, a little different back then. <laughs> but Joseph comes along. I want you to pick up with me in the story in Genesis chapter 37. We're going to start in verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brother. And the lad was with the son of Bilpa and son of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought the bad report of them to his father. Now, Israel loved Joseph. Let's pause right. Who's Israel? That's Jacob. Earlier, when he had the encounter with God, God changed his name from Jacob, the great deceiver, to Israel. So now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and they could not speak peaceably to him. Let's stop right there. So here you have a, a family quarrel, a family dysfunction. Now remember the previous generation, Jacob had one brother that hated him. Imagine Joseph had 11 brothers that hated him. Now you would think Joseph would recognize that he's not well loved. Now what's even more fascinating is Jacob... He was the result of not being the favorite son. 
Remember, his older brother Esau was the favorite. So Jacob grew up in a home where he was always trying to get his dad's attention. He was always trying and never worked. So he learned the art of deception to get what he wanted. What's fascinating about that to me is that much of Jacob probably hated being raised in that kind of environment, in that kind of home. Guess what he did? He, get, he had a favorite son. You would think, you would think that, man, I don't ever want to do that with my children. That's my experience, and I don't want to do that here. And I don't know how to explain this, and I don't want to highlight it to make it all feel weird and awkward. I want to highlight it for one primary purpose. Sometimes the very thing that you don't ever want to become, you actually end up doing. Now, Chris V has a great message on that, and you can go dig that up sometime. But what I want to say here, this is why it's crucial that you and I, every area of our life is submitted to the grace of Jesus Christ. So he can cover you even when you're doing things that are not smart. So Joseph now, he had the favorite son. It created a bunch of animosity. And then Joseph, his frontal lobe wasn't fully developed yet. He's 17 years old and he gets this idea. He's like, I'm going to tell my brothers about all my dreams I'm having. Which if you were 25 or 30, you would not do what you do at 17 years old. But Joseph is 17, so let's read what he does in verse 5. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brother, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I had dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheep stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, you would think that Joseph would got a cue by now. His brother don't like him. They've already hated him twice as he's telling the dream. But he said, hey, guys, I have another dream I want to tell you. So in verse 9, he said, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brother and said, look. I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his fathers rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. The hate, vitriol, the animosity got to such a point in these eleven brothers that they begin to conspire. How do we get rid of him? So here you have a kid who's 17 years old. Now, I don't know if you know many dreamers in your life. I'm so appreciative of Ben Armstrong, who had really been spearheading the dream culture in this environment of dreams and interpretations of dreams. I'm so thankful for that. But if you're not around dreamers, the thing about dreamers is they're always looking towards the future. They're like, oh, I've seen it. I've seen the picture. I don't understand the dream I have, but I know it's painting a picture of what's coming. And dreamers have aspirations. How how many have ever had dreams in life, but it seems like you're getting farther and farther and farther away from your dreams? It's fascinating that you have a dream in life and you begin to attach your emotion to that dream. This is why I hate house shopping, because I I am so easily inspired. I emotionally connect very easily. So I go into a home and I'm like, this is it. And I'm like deeply getting connected. And my wife is way smarter than me. She's like, don't get excited. I'm like, I can't help it. It's just happening right now. I love this place. And then escrow falls through. And you're just absolutely devastated. This is what dreamers do. They attach themselves to something that is out there. And then all of a sudden life begins to happen. And this is why it's good to know your future actually has the back door. Because right now the front door is getting smaller and smaller because you're getting farther and farther away from the thing that you've been connected to. So Joseph now is, to make a long story short, his brother wants to kill him. One of them said, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. Okay, that's a better idea. Let's throw him in a pit. So they throw him in a pit. That one brother leaves, and they, then the other brother's sitting there going, hey, there's some Midianite traders going by. Let's sell them into slavery. At least get the money out of it. Like, sounds great. So Reuben comes back and said, what'd you do with them? They said, oh, we sold them to some guy driving by. And it's just these brothers started fighting. And then at that point, they took Joseph's coat, dipped it into blood, into goat's blood, took it back to Jacob. Remember, this is his favorite son took it back to his father and said, your son has been killed by wild animals. So while Jacob is mourning the loss of a proposed deceased son, Joseph is sold into slavery. Now we're going to fast forward the story to chapter 39, verse 1. So now Joseph is a slave in Egypt. 
Potiphar, who is a very wealthy man, hires him. So let's read in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guards, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now look at verse 2. I want you to highlight this. The Lord was with Joseph. Say that with me. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of the master, the Egyptian. Have you ever been in a season of life where nothing's working, but yet the Lord's with you? I, 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 want, I want to connect some dots here because there are numerous places in Scripture. I'm noticing a, a pattern, if you will, an algorithm, if I can even go that far. That sometimes it's almost a guarantee if you are in the worst season or moment scenario and you can sense the Lord is with you, just get ready because there's a back door that's about to open up. You need to understand this. So all of a sudden, Daniel, if you back to the book of Daniel, or forward to the book of Daniel, you have another example he had taken into a Babylonian captivity. And in there, the Lord is with Daniel and caused him to rise in favor. So here we have Joseph. He's rising in favor. It got to such a point that Potiphar, he said, to, he said I have trusted Joseph with my entire livelihood that all he had to think about is what he eat. That's it. So Joseph became a very powerful man. What I think it's important for us to recognize before I move on is this, is that when the Lord is with you, get ready for a back door to your future to open up. Now what happens next is pretty bad as well. So Joseph is getting tons of favor and he's very attractive to Potiphar's wife, who we find out is a seductive person. And every day she's coming on to Joseph saying, lie with me, lie with me. And he's like, I don't want to lie with you. I'm good. I don't need you. I'm smart. And every day he kept saying, I want to lie with you. I want to lie with you. And then one day it was just Potiphar's wife and Joseph in the house. No one else was there. And Potiphar's wife saying, lie with me and grabs him. And he says, no, why would I do that when your husband has trusted me with everything? So he takes off running. Well, she gets a hold of his jacket, his coat. And then that night when the husband comes home, Potiphar comes home, he goes, she goes up to him and says, Joseph tried to lie with me today. And here's the coat to prove it. Potiphar lost it and throws him in jail. So now Joseph is now taking a massive step. He's been rejected by his family, sold into slavery, and now he's in prison. How many would say he's moving a lot farther away from his future? So now he's in prison. Imagine this guy. But what's phenomenal about this guy, no matter where he is, he is successful. There's no record of him moaning or complaining. It doesn't mean he didn't. I'm sure there were moments. But he seemed to have a knack for going, God is with me and I'll make everything around me awesome. No matter what the scenario is, I will make this place beautiful. If you end up in a prison, then make your prison look awesome. If you're in slavery, then be the best slave there is. If you've been rejected, been rejected by your family, then walk in the ways of the Lord. Don't counteract the way that they treated you. Are you guys with me? So here we have Joseph is now in prison. Imagine that. And then there's a, sh there's a baker and a chef. And there's his prison mates. And the prison guards trusted Joseph with all the watch of the prison. He's now, again, no matter where Joseph is, he always rises to the top. Why? Because the Lord was with him, which is a good reminder for us. Now, these two guys have a dream. It's fascinating. Dreams keep coming up. Joseph is the dreamer and interpreter of dream. These two guys have a dream. They wake up one morning. They say, Joseph, we had these dreams last night. And Joseph goes, isn't God the interpreter of all dreams? Tell me your dream. So they tell him the dreams. And one guy, he goes, mm, I'm really sorry, but you're going to be killed. Now, that takes a lot of courage. I mean, think about that for a moment. Imagine you being Joseph. I'd be like, how do I tell this guy the interpretation of his dream? You know what? Something bad's going to happen to you, so just kind of get ready for it. No, he tells him straight up, really sorry, but you're going to be killed. Then he looked at the other guy and said, oh, you know what? Your, your dream's different. You're actually going to get out of prison and be restored to back to where you were. So imagine that day. One guy devastated. The other guy stoked. Now, a day comes where the baker, he gets restored back to his position in Pharaoh's house. Okay, stay with me. I just have a few more minutes. He's restored back to his position in Pharaoh's house. And on the way out the door, Joseph goes, don't forget about me. Well, he forgets about Joseph. So now let's go to chapter 41. 
Between chapter 39 and chapter 41, the big guy, Pharaoh, has a dream, has a couple dreams. And he consults with his people in his life, and nobody could interpret the dream. And so he asked, who can interpret the dream? Well, the guy that got out of prison thought, oh, I totally forgot. There was a guy in prison, a Hebrew man, that interpreted my dream for me. And so they said, well, go get him. So they bring him out and look at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. And verse 15 on is basically the story of Pharaoh telling Joseph his dream, and Joseph tells him the interpretation. This is probably the main point I'm trying to get to today. You are one text message away from your breakthrough. You are one direct message, you are one email, you are one phone call away from your breakthrough. Imagine that moment right there. Joseph has been rejected by family, in a pit, sold into slavery, been lied about by Potiphar's wife, is now in prison, and in one moment, everything changed. See, there is a back door to your future. Some of you need to hear this today. You've had so many setbacks, you've lost hope. You've lost courage. You've lost the will to fight. I'm telling you, if the Lord is with you, all it takes is one text message to get you back in the palace. And so Joseph interprets the dreams. And I love this part. He's, he doesn't just interpret the dream. He says, hey, would you, what you should do, Pharaoh, is you should hire somebody to make sure that you have enough food in the time of famine. And so Pharaoh says, you're my guy. So he hired Joseph, and he takes him from the palace, not to just interpret the dream, but elevates him to number two in all of Egypt. And he gives him the number two, the second chariot. So basically, Pharaoh got the Bugatti, <laughs> Veyron, and then Joseph got the, uh, let's see, what car did Joseph get? I think he got the Bentley. Maybe Rolls Royce Phantom, I don't know. What's the point? He was given all the wealth, all the accolades, and all the assets just like that in one night. Some of you in this room need to be waiting for that text message. Some of you need to actually wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know what? An email could come in, a text message, an Instagram post, a Facebook post. Something is going to happen that I'm going to, all these years of setback, the 20 years of setback, is actually going to propel me into my future farther than I've ever dreamed. And later in chapter 41, I'm going to end with this. Joseph has two sons, and he names his sons two different names, and one of them was, God has forgotten, I have forgotten all my past. And then the other one, God has blessed me. What's the point? That in one moment, Joseph was propelled out of his past, out of his pain, out of his bitterness, and God put him back in a position of authority. What I want to do before we close today is I want to pray for people that resonate with Joseph. You feel like that front door to your future is completely out of sight. And I'm here to tell you that there is a back door. Just be ready. If you resonate with Joseph at all, I want you to stand because we're going to pray for you. You've had so many dreams. You've had so many ambitions, so many ideas. And you're like, man, I I can't remember the last time I actually was excited about my dream. And I felt the Lord today is actually saying, I'm about to bring a back door your way that's going to skip the entire process. And we're going to put you back to farther than where you started. If you're sitting by someone that's uh, standing, I want you to put your hand on them, and we're going to pray for them right now. Father, I thank you for the courage for the people that are standing right now. And I pray right now that everything we talked about and whatever was missed or not fully understood when it comes to Joseph and the life of rejection, lies, deception, pain, and bitterness, and incredible setbacks, And in one moment, a back door opened to go right into their future. I pray for everyone in this room right now would be infused with hope beyond their time and hope beyond their years. I pray they've lost hope, lost passion, lost desire. It would be be given back to them in this very moment. And I also declare that a back door would open. Say that with me. Back door will open. And we bless you. Everybody said... Amen. Why don't we have everyone stand? Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is being translated into multiple languages. Please visit podcasts.ibethel.org.